Buonasera, good evening everybody for the ones connected from Central Europe. My name is Luca Giustiniano. I'm delighted to be the moderator of a super interesting Clio debate on the power of data tonight. Just a few words of introduction. This is uh, Lewis University. We are um, located at the Loft, which is a lab of fabulous things. And Clio stands for the Center for Research in Leadership, Innovation, and Organization. And we are delighted to have two uh, very distinguished guests tonight. We have Luisella Gianni, uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa Head of Strategy and Transformation at Oracle, and Professor Michael Flimmerborn, Professor of Communication and Digital Transformations at Copenhagen Business School. The debate is going to be about the power of data and the intersection between data and technology. So with no further ado, I will leave virtually the floor to our guest for his presentation of the idea of combining data, technology in a prism, which is a very fascinating geometric figure. So Mikkel, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here, and um, I'm really happy that we could uh, set this up. I have a few slides that I'll show you, um, if I can get them on the screen. So if I... Um, had one chance to go back in time. Um, I think I would go back to the moment where the printing press became a central technology, uh, a piece of an inv invention that in many ways, maybe at the time didn't seem so um, incredible or so different from uh, other types of technologies. And um, now I'm wearing a mask, so you can't see, you, you won't be laughing at this picture as you're supposed to, but I would be standing in the middle, as you see, and um, enjoying this kind of um, adventure that the printing press created. So, as you all know, or I think you all know, we um, realized, at least in hindsight, that many of the things we associate with the modern society, like um, a public sphere, uh, um, possibility for national culture, um, cult different languages, and so on, so many things came um, from the printing press. It was associated with the types of technological developments that seemed very simple at the time, but in hindsight, obviously, uh, um, are very important. So I say this because I think we will look back in time and think about the technologies and the types of data-driven approaches and so on that we see now in a similar manner. We'll see that they created so many uh, different types of um, um, new developments and so on. So let me talk briefly about the book and uh, the sort of um, backdrop to the book, which is uh, an interest in these digital transformations. So what happens when technologies are not just a sort of cyberspace that we lock onto and lock off again, but become a kind of societal backbone that we rely on in multiple uh, parts of our social lives? I'm also interested in the sort of shift from um, what you can think of as digitalization into datafication. So the shift from simply turning analog phenomena into digital phenomena, and then the moment when data becomes a kind of resource and a kind of driver for a lot of different uh, developments. So I think the, the sort of um, backdrop to this is this realization that we have a wealth of digital transformations that create a kind of um, new condition, a new kind of communication space that we need to conceptualize. So I try this in the book, offer a kind of um, broad conceptualization of these digital spaces. And I think what characterizes these spaces is that visibility becomes a kind of default. So in the past, it was much easier to hide, it was much easier to um, be off the grid and so on. But with these te um, technological developments, it becomes possible to see and know everything. And this is why I talk about this digital prism. So I uh, think of this term as a way to sort of problematize um, a, a sort of notion of transparency that's simply about letting us see everything, um, show everything, and, and so on. And I think what happens in these situations with digital transformations are actually much more complicated. So um, I think a, a way to sort of think about digital transformations is to look at how they facilitate new forms of visibility, new forms of work that's about sharing and hiding and showing and so on. So I'm interested in these visibility practices. And this is why um, the key concept is this idea of the digital prism. 
it's not a window we open on reality, but it's a much more sort of complicated um, set of practices and uh, refractions that come out of digital technologies. And this, I think, has relevance for all of us in all dimensions of social life. So in the book, I look first at uh, what happens to the individual. What does it mean to live in a society or a, a workplace or a private life where everything can be seen and everything can be shared and so on? So I look at different phenomena like uh, digital doubles, this idea of um, us having a sort of set of digital traces that often come to represent who we are and, and in some cases are used um, to judge us and assess us and so on rather than the physical human body and so to speak. Then I look in a second chapter at um, organizations that uh, pick up on these ideals about transparency and become very engaged in having to um, also manage their visibilities. So um, a lot of conversations and act activities that have to do with um, making sure that you come across as the organization you want to and um, whole sort of uh, organizational cultures that are built around these uh, ideas about transparency. Then the book goes on to also look at what happens to society and politics in situations where transparency or visibility becomes this default. And here I look at um, how tech companies engage in reporting about their practices. I look at uh, political parties that uh, live stream everything and other types of uh, developments where this question of visibility management becomes central. So I think the overall sort of um, purpose of the book and the idea that I want to discuss today is really what happens when visibility management becomes this fundamental social phenomenon. A phenomenon that's both about recognition, so um, knowing who we are and showing who we are and so on, but also a matter of control, that we are in new ways um, made visible and uh, asked or sort of uh, more or less forced to live in these uh, digital spaces that are really um, can be stored and reproduced and, um, and datafied in so many different ways. So in thinking about this, I also draw on my colleagues, um, Kalinikos and Alaimo, who are in this room, and they talk about this apparatus of data technologies and algorithms, and this is exactly the kind of uh, framing that I think we should be looking for. So how are these technological developments that we also see as a result of the, the pandemic and so on, creating new, these new conditions for the lives of individuals, for organizations, and for societies. So I think I will um, stop here, and I think these are important questions because right now we're obviously focused on these big tech companies and the, the role they play and so on, but I think once they um, also become more like normal companies and maybe lose some of their um, glamour as this uh, artwork from uh, uh, an, an artist called, um, I can't remember his name, um, but, but this is a really uh, cool piece, I think, and the sec next one is also interesting. It shows us you know, the kinds of developments that uh, come when companies that at some point seem um, impossible to challenge and so on also become more like normal companies and, and uh, the techniques they use and so on start to seep into other parts of uh, our societies. So I will stop here and uh, hand it over to you again. Thank you very much, Mikkel. And um, before I hand the floor to uh, Luis Gianni, let me just remark a few things. First of all, we are on streaming on YouTube and Facebook, so feel free to use the chat of our social media or use the WhatsApp number, which is flashing out from time to time during this, uh, this event. Um, second, with uh, Christina Lyman, Yannis Kandinikos, our colleagues and CLIO members who facilitated this, this event tonight, we often discuss about technology. We have been studying technologies for years and years, and now it seems that everything is kicking back, saying, oh, now it's the real deal with all this uh, invasion of technology, data, datafication, as you, as you name it, techno stress, and, and related. But uh, I wanted to underline a quote from your book that really impressed me. Uh, you said at a point, many people are concerned about the unchecked powers of tech giants and the hidden operations of big data and algorithms. So it seems that technology is kind of um, 
leaving the, the very perimeter of the businesses in the companies, and it's kind of uh, uh, affecting the overall, overall society. As we have a pristine representative of a tech giant, uh, represented here by Luisa Lajani, we'll give her the floor, because she's gonna react to your, uh, to your perspective, and if I can anticipate just a little bit, she's gonna show us that uh, high technology means low touch, that it could have also some bright side in this uh, perceivedness of, of the presence of the, the giants. We say that, Gianni, the floor is virtually yours. Thanks for being uh, with us tonight. Thanks a lot, uh, and also thanks again for, oops, sorry, setting up. Uh, can you hear me properly? Just give me a sign or tell me if you can hear me. This, and again, thanks for having me uh, today, and thanks also for setting up uh, this virtually. You know, I was planning to be present, uh, but it was a bit challenging today. So thanks a lot also to everyone that is uh, making this possible. I would like to start uh, uh, with few data. Uh, that is a bit of recap of the latest months. So as you all know, we had like uh, almost uh, in 90 countries. Uh, close to two months, 60 days of lockdown that obviously were affecting our behavior. During the lockdown, what we saw, we saw people consuming a lot of social media. The big winner in this case was TikTok. Okay, so a bit, all social media were growing, uh, maybe Facebook a bit less, but TikTok was booming, like you see, like plus two billion downloads and then also gaming like a new way of gaming. Um, probably every one of you um, was uh, reading news about the Fortnite concert uh, done by Scott Travis. This was really important, why? Because it was almost the first, uh, the first time that we had a concert done in virtual reality. And there is uh, now a lot of startup, a lot of companies that are growing now also to create the avatar for the celebs that would like to uh, imitate what Scott Travis has done. Uh, interesting enough for me, you know, this is not only for what we call the B2C market, also in B2B customers truly think that manufacturers should use much more technology, also being mobile first. Uh, something else, again, really interesting that this is, you know, this title is an article from the MIT that they were running a study. Uh, again, what happened during the latest few months? Uh, many companies they saw an increase, uh, close to 40% of usage of chatbot and digital assistant to perform different activities from service, but also to uh, requests related to sales uh, and marketing. Then another data, extremely interesting, another survey, increase of plus 90% and plus 120% using online and mobile to do activities related to research and evaluate also in the buying cycle. This is what I do like the most, okay? Is, this is a study that was done for US, but I think it's comparable also to Europe, uh, they analyzed uh, the growing of e-commerce. So in the latest 10 years versus uh, the eight weeks uh, of the lockdown. So what we, you see the increase uh, of 10 years is comparable uh, to what we saw in eight weeks. So this is amazing, you know, it's like uh, apparently the pandemic uh, was a strong acceleration for the digitalization. Here you see some data, even if these data are not updated, because this plus 120% is referred to Italy only to the, per to the time of the lockdown, so it's much more. So this is the pure online, the pure e-commerce. If you look at other form, like click to collect, is close to plus 300% and also effect on B2B, so that usually they are a bit behind, but you see plus for 24% uh, for B2B large company and close to plus 50% for smaller company. Disruption in uh, um, supply chain, so what does it mean? A lot of companies now, they are considering to what is called reshoring. 
also not having any more uh, um, global supply chain, but uh, also to consider uh, regional option. All of us, we started working from uh, home, so this is not really smart working, it's more home working. Anyhow, people that they tried it for the first time, 75% would like to continue to have the possibility to work from home also, you know, after the pandemic, even if the big barrier is that several, they don't have the right equipment. So only 33% of the families, they do have a PC or tablet they can use, uh, uh, let's say, for working if it's not provided by their company. This data is from Italy, but I was talking with some other colleagues in other countries in Europe, and, you know, you will be surprised that in other countries uh, it's similar. And we saw um, also another big increase of uh, usage of digitalization and technology. Mobile for health and safety, what does it mean? A lot of companies, they started using a mobile app to inform their employees about, um, I will say, the new policies, maybe if they have to change the turn, if they can go to office, not go to office, but also to report incident, uh, to report, you know, if they think that they may have uh, uh, being exposed uh, to COVID and so on. So mobile big winner. Uh, funny enough, you know, here it's not in this slide, but we were running also a survey uh, on over 12,000 people uh, in 11 countries, also in Italy, about uh, uh, their uh, um, mental health. Okay, and the question was a set of different questions. I mean, first, Re result is that people are really stressed out, so the majority of people consider this year the most stressful year uh, in their life. And uh, second, when asked, would you prefer to talk with a human or with uh, a chatbot about your mental health, close to 70% replied, I do prefer a chatbot. And uh, uh, out of these 70%, uh, uh, almost 68%, uh, uh, they do prefer to talk with a chatbot instead of talking with their manager about, you know, uh, their mental health, their well-being at work. So really interesting data. I'm not going to comment this year. We can, uh, we can comment maybe later on. Other really interesting, I mean, I'm showing this to you because I was really surprised about this finding. Uh, we saw a big increase of the usage of social media. Anyhow, social media were used mainly for funny stuff. When people were looking for information about the pandemic, they were relying on TV. So it's incredible to see that uh, all around Europe uh, there is, we, we experienced uh, an increase of TV consumption also in younger people. You see Italy 40% plus 40%, Spain plus 35%. Why? Because they trust more apparently news uh, coming from TV than news coming from social media. So how we do describe, uh, you know, what is happening, this acceleration of digitalization uh, really um, brought by the pandemic, the framework that I like to use is the low-touch model. In short, what does it mean? Activities that are uh, named high-touch are all the ones that are implying uh, a face-to-face -face relationship or, you know, human uh, talking each other or being in presence. And this is the classic way uh, people were uh, doing sales uh, or service. Low touch, it means all the hybrid model. If we think about technology, a typical example is marketing automation. So you may uh, send uh, a set of different content and message. When you see that someone is reacting to certain message, it could be a video or a content, then you think that this person is ready to be contacted, then you can ask to a salesperson to call the person. No touch is what we see increasing is like chatbot or self-service activities. So it means everything is done digitally and there is no interaction um, with a human being. Following this concept, something that is becoming pretty popular right now is also the concept of digital empathy and uh, personalization. Um, how you do it, and you know, this is the topic of today, thanks to data. Uh, what is the concept of digital empathy? Is the concept of uh, uh, providing to the people uh, the information they are looking for 
in a way that is contextually relevant to them and is at the right time. So all the concept of uh, uh, having the right content at the right time in the right channel and also in a way to predict what is the intent and what is what you want to do in that moment. So maybe you want to have information about, you know, a concert or maybe you want to uh, have a comparison between two products and so on. The logic behind this is like to, I would say, collect data about your preference, analyze the data through machine learning, and to be able in real time to provide the information you are looking for. And you know, providing you this information is called a digital empathy because the concept is okay. I don't bore you with an overload of information, but only with uh, what you need. And during this time, we saw example of a lot of companies that were also um, trying to adapt fast to, uh, let's say, the new low-touch model, offering uh, new services. For instance, Volvo was uh, actually, Volvo launched the subscription model already a couple of years ago, but now this is booming. Why? Because people, maybe they don't want to buy a car, but at the same time, they don't want to get uh, to use public transportation. So they may get, they may subscribe to this uh, new way of having a car. So they do pay 200 bucks uh, per month, and they can have access to different models. Or hotels that were moving, uh, you know, to become a kind of home office because this is not a co-working, but they were renting the room uh, like your office space. Uh, opening new channel. I mean, this is something that we have, we have done with the New York State because they needed to inform people really fast about, you know, all the different measures to be taken uh, to try to contain COVID. And also they were using a different form, online chatbot and so on. Uh, shops like Vision Wars, they do sell glasses they decided to open only by appointment and also to use online to provide personalization in terms of model, also with augmented reality and other technologies. Or, you know, also Motorola that was also offering some of the option and accelerating what they were already doing that was mainly having front office and back office integrated. As I was mentioning before, a conversational assistant in the form of voice bot and chat bot, they saw an absolutely uh, big increase. Oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, what we saw also, for instance, this is uh, really interesting, uh, is an application we have done for uh, Pompeii. Uh, and why this is interesting? Because it's uh, mixing a lot of new technologies, so from uh, IoT to augmented reality and blockchain. Again, uh, through a set of sensors, they track uh, where people are, okay? And this is done for security reasons, because they want to be sure that there are not too many people in a certain area of Pompeii. Uh, they do collect also, obviously, all the name, uh, all the data, because they are obliged to do also for uh, the measure uh, anti-pandemic. Uh, and uh, those data are recorded on the blockchain. So it means that whenever there is a variation that someone uh, say, okay, I may be uh, sick, uh, through the blockchain they have a guarantee that you know all the chain is um, is informed. So this is obviously, uh, it's really interesting. Now I'm, I'm treating it at high level, but it's really interesting also for the way how different technologies are, are used. So, um, a summary of what we do see happening now, we do see uh, that the low touch is touching uh, all the different sides of the business, so from marketing and branding, so uh, artificial intelligence and the concept of digital empathy, to predict the micro moment and to often real time in, let's say, the preferred channel, a certain personalized content, E-commerce uh, is becoming more and more relevant and someone is saying message and conversation are now becoming the commerce because the face-to-face -face inter interaction is limited. We do see new model like subscription but also home delivery of everything. So we are getting used to simply uh, buy on e-commerce and get, be delivered at home, whatever. Uh, contactless and cashless in terms of payment are as a consequence becoming more popular. Everyone is rethinking the concept of omnichannel, also giving uh, uh, more space and more importance to the digital part of the omnichannel. 
caring, caring about your customer, caring about your employee. So the concept of caring is becoming more relevant and in a way substituting a bit the concept of service also as a way of uh, having, uh, uh, as a, way, a new way of loyalty. And then, you know, uh, something else that we notice uh, is that there is a kind of blending of our private and work identity. This is a forced blending. And uh, we are discovering, in a way, the smart working uh, also considered as a choice. Okay, right now we are all in home working. And, you know, the next step will be, okay, can we really uh, decide when work from home and when instead work uh, from, uh, uh, from office? So, thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much, Luisa Lagiani, for this super rich um, window opening on the, on, on the world of data and uh, related technology. Um, before asking a reaction to, to Miguel, I just, there was something that was you know, flashing out in my mind, which is uh, you were discussing about hidden operations by these tech giants, but she's telling us that sometimes it's we humans that we want to hide from other humans. So how do you see that in this trajectory of uh, datafied lives we're, gonna, we're living and we're going to live even more? Mikkel. Thank you so much. No, I think when we um, rewrite or will write the history of technology as it uh, pertains to today, I, will, I think we'll think of the pandemic as a, a really important moment in time. So think about the role of 9-11 when it came to policies around privacy, around... Um, Again, you know, setting some limits to these tech giants and so on. 9-11 was a moment where um, questions about privacy were wiped out because security became the main issue, right? Stopping these people who had uh, um, eradicated the, two, the Twin Towers and so on. So I think we'll think of the pa pandemic also as a sort of key moment in time when um, a lot of technology suddenly uh, just exploded into our personal lives and our work lives and so on. And I think what we will um, realize in hindsight is that, yes, we could do so many things, so many things could be uh, kept alive, like an event like this and so on, but we also have to think about what is sort of lost when technology becomes um, the backbone and the only sort of uh, infrastructure for human interactions and so on. So I think my hope is that we will use this opportunity to maybe go back and sort of cherish the sanctuaries that are not um, datafied and not digitalized and make room for both, so to speak. So maybe think of digital technologies not as a sort of force that should take over everything, but as a kind of um, safety net that can catch us when normal types of interactions are no longer possible and so on. So I think, I hope we will use it as an opportunity to, uh, to both sort of choose technology in some cases, but also um, refrain from using technology. There are parts of social life that maybe don't need to be digital and datafied. Thank you very much, Mikkel. Uh, let me reach the, the, the provocation to Luisella a little bit. Uh, Mikkel is speaking about cherishing some areas of our life that, in which technology should not enter or we should not turn into, into data. You very brilliantly presented the difference between low touch and no touch. But where do you see the boundary of this? Uh, where is the boundary between low touch and, and, and no touch? And how do you envision that in terms of development in your industry? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And uh, I would say the boundaries uh, is something that each of us need to decide where to put it. I would say, I, I try to explain this better, and in a way, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm really aware of uh, all the different uh, uh, debate that we do have around uh, uh, privacy or around security, also the risk, you know, that we do have uh, living uh, all of our data, you know, it's like each of us, uh, um, is like leaving a piece, a puzzle of information that anyhow, you know, uh, big tech, uh, yes, can uh, also understand what are your interests and so on. And today, 
uh, maybe those are used for uh, marketing and advertisement, but obviously uh, tomorrow maybe they could be misused, misused for, for other things. So uh, I believe that the boundary is, uh, uh, and what I usually do care, is that people should be aware and should be conscious about the type of information they do share and what they don't want to share. And they are, they should become more and more aware about that there are some activities that you can do in no touch or low touch mode. And as we saw, in some cases, maybe people do prefer to have a low touch or no touch. I give you a really basic example, but probably if I need to call my uh, communication provider and I simply need to have an update about my uh, connection or I want to top up my um, uh, phone um, card, okay, maybe this is an activity really simple that I don't need to, to spend 10 minutes of my life waiting that someone at the call center is going to reply me and, you know, is going to read a script and probably providing me the same information I can read in an FAQ or I can get from a chatbot, you know, because this is something that I do prefer to do it by myself and to solve it by myself. So for all the aspects that are related to basic service, uh, this is something I think good. Other aspect that I think we are more entering in the area of uh, you know, social media or uh, the kind of uh, private or intimate information we do share about ourselves, I would say what I do notice, people often, uh, they seem a bit unaware of the kind of data okay that they are leaving and how those data could be used so you know for me i uh, to in short to reply i think each of us should be aware of uh, how data can be used in the good and the bad and you know the boundaries i hope that uh, you know people they become aware and they can set up the boundaries based on what best work for them Thank you very much. Um, I have a very, yeah, I got a curiosity. I'm gonna start again from you, Lucel, and then leave the floor to Mikkel. Um, you have a, an international responsibility in, in your area of, of accountability in your company. And you have described that overall we're a little bit uh, more stressed than we were in 2019. And uh, this was very fascinating. If we need help, we would prefer to ask a chatbot rather than uh, another human being. Do you see that as a kind of an homogeneous phenomena in all the areas that you are under the umbrella of your responsibility or you see some cultural uh, nuances or differences? I think it's, it's, bad. it's quite homogeneous, you know, some, something that was, uh, let's say, my, uh, in my mind, I thought, okay, probably if you do have, uh, uh, you know, countries like Italy or Spain, uh, you know, it's a bit the stereotype, but, you know, maybe we are considered a bit more talkative uh, and that we do like human interaction and maybe countries a bit more in the Nordics and so on, or Asia even. Uh, maybe they will be a bit more preferred to talk with a, with a robot. The results we found are homogeneous, so it means there are really similarities. And we tried also to understand why, okay? And uh, we, we also, there is a survey about what are, why you do prefer a chatbot instead of a human. And you know, the reply are really interesting. Related to mental health and well-being, the first reason is that the chatbot doesn't judge. Okay, so people, they do rely on a chatbot because they think it's not a human being that always, even if it's really neutral, uh, has an idea about me. And also, uh, probably because it's available 24-7, and you can exit from the conversation without any implication. So just imagine you are talking about your problem with a friend or even with a psychologist. Uh, well, you need to take another appointment and the friend of the psychologist will do um, a lot of questions uh, and maybe will put you in, in a bit of embarrassment uh, and you need to face some problem. And, and sometimes, you know, people, they simply want to speak and to have someone that is listening without judging and always available. And so this is emerged from uh, at least this survey. Thank you very much, Lucella. Um, yeah. Turning the question to, to Mikkel, I mean, it seems that if we want to enjoy a moment, we call a friend. And if we, if we have a serious issue, we refer to a chatbot. How do you see that in terms of uh, datafied living? 
Thank you. So I, I certainly think we need to have a focus on human choice. I mean, in many ways, these technological developments are happening because people want these smart solutions. They want ease of access and so on. But I still think it's a mistake to uh, say that everything should be decided by individuals. And this is also what I talk about in the book, that with these, these digital te developments, a lot of responsibility is placed on the individual. And we seem to have a sort of discourse around this, that everything is something that humans as individuals should take care of. They need to decide what data to share. They need to decide uh, what services to use and so on. But what this overlooks, I think, is the huge sort of um, information asymmetry. And this is what I talk about in the book, that these, these tech companies know everything about people, and we know very little about these companies in return. So I think this is also where questions about regulation, about um, sort of guidelines and standards for how to operate a company and so on, have to go hand in hand with this focus on human choice. So many things should not be left up to individuals because it's too much of a responsibility, I think. Thank you very much. So uh, in other words, for a larger audience, you're saying that uh, we, as human beings, we don't have enough agency for taking care of ourselves and setting the boundary between what should be shared, what should be not shared, and what should we control, what should be you know, referred to other control sources. Yeah, these are not individual problems like many other problems like the climate and so on, we can't say, you know, everyone just needs to take care of it individually. We, I mean, this is why we have democracies, institutions, um, regulatory bodies and so on. This is to also set boundaries in a, in a much more sort of, a, you know, at the level of society. Thank you. Lucelle, what's your opinion on that? for asking and, and you know the, the point is that there is uh, on one side uh, I truly believe that uh, I, I think and I understand Michael's point okay is uh, a society um, team okay something that we need to face as a society and indeed I mean you see that there are a lot of uh, regulation like GDPR and so on on the other side, you know, my belief is that regulation, especially when we are talking about digital, will be either late, luckily, at least at this moment, uh, or the risk is that is also, um, I mean, there is, sometimes there is not the knowledge, okay, because sometimes it's really technical knowledge or specialized knowledge uh, to allow, okay, to have some regulation that is really making the point. So for this reason, I do agree that is a society team and is also the way it should be treated. Anyhow, it is sometimes really difficult to find the perfect balance between the concept of freedom uh, and also, you know, uh, the responsibility that should be in the society and the individual, in the, in the individual. So that's also the reason why I say, okay, yes, society and institution have to play a role and are already doing. Anyhow, I also trust that uh, we can't uh, also give up our individual responsibility of being aware of what we do, and you know, also the I will say there is also a shared responsibility that is also partially of the institution of uh, educating people and these education start from schools i mean you can also start really from uh, elementary school from from kids to uh, really making them aware about what is the impact because if they know what is the impact of their activities or the data that they share they are becoming uh, adult that they can take in the, they can take choice for themselves so you know is is a bit in the middle and i think it's really difficult to find the balance and in a way we are learning by doing, because if you think it's the first time in the human history that we do have this kind of technologies, also, you know, if you think about social media, that may have an impact on millions of people. It's something that we never experience, and so sometimes it's, it's good, you know, to understand both sides and difficult to find the perfect balance still. Thank you very much. Let me take another angle, if I, if I may. I mean, uh, during the 80s and the 90s, we were all starving for data. Today, I, uh, I recall um, a quote from William Deming who said, without data, you're a person, just a person with an opinion. 
And now, 2020, we are just flooded with, with data. And we scholars tend to say, well, you can have a lot of data, but if you, you don't have a solid theory or a solid set of theories, you can have whatever data you want, but you don't have a pure understanding of what's going on. So, Mikkel, you collected many theories for developing your argument in your book, and then you propose a set of theoretical models and concepts. In a nutshell, what's your theory about this flooding of data which is overwhelming us, and uh, how can we, you know, st still defend our humanness in being so much infused and exposed to technology? Thank you. That's a really broad question that I could uh, easily spend an hour on. But I think this is really a moment where we have to talk both about technology, but uh, not m mainly on technology. I think we need to focus on the other dimensions of social life that feed into this. So I think rather than um, focus on the next technology that will come and how people pick up new smart solutions and so on, I think we need to step back a little bit and think about you know, what are the kind of workplaces we want to develop, what are the kinds of um, public institutions we want to create, what are the forms of um, sort of uh, politics and so on that we, that we as societies have ambitions for. So I think in many ways, bracketing the question of technology a little bit and going back to fundamental questions about what kind of childhood do we want for our kids? What kind of schools do we want? What kind of workplaces do we want to uh, inhabit? And so on. I think these are questions that uh, open up um, the focus from technology to many, many other questions that I think the literature has maybe overlooked. So this, this focus on technology, I think, takes away um, from the much broader, much sort of, sort of uh, fundamental questions about human conditions and so on. Thank you very much. Luisella, on your side, being the, on the technology and data side, uh, what kind of theories would you like us scholars to develop for uh, having a better world in this uh, very rich of data kind of setting in which we all live? Yeah, this is, you know, like the classic uh, one billion question <laughs> is like, uh, I, I would say sometime we should exit from, uh, you know, the myth that was uh, probably a bit abused of uh, uh, technology um, is used for making the world a better place. Okay, technology can be used for making the world a better place. It can be used, especially, you know, data for also controlling people, okay? And this, uh, uh, we do know. So in this case, I fully agree that we need also to have institution uh, protecting us. Anyhow, what is important is like, uh, uh, let's say, maybe technology company, they may have some time the instinct to develop technology for technology's sake. What does it mean? I mean, and this is like, uh, probably is a bit the engineer mindset that uh, uh, someone is really enthusiastic of discovering something new uh, and say, okay, I do it, even if I don't know yet uh, what's the usage of it, okay? So, and I think the role of um, uh, the scholar or the role of researcher is also to help uh, also the engineers uh, into putting uh, the framework and to be critical and to say, okay, this technology, what, uh, uh, why this is useful? Okay, what is the human side of the technology? How this could be helpful to human? How this could be really uh, help us to build uh, a better place. So often is like to be sure that we, we do have a framework of analysis because, you know, back to the quotation, to the quote before, it's true that, uh, you know, people without data, they have uh, uh, only one opinion, but often what is happening now that we are overloaded by the data, and so if we don't have a framework of analysis, uh, how do we want to, um, what's the meaning uh, we do want to give to data? We do have just a lot of uh, noise, okay, and we don't have real data, and this is typical, you know, uh, if someone, if someone of you never had the chance to train uh, you know, an algorithm, uh, one of the first thing that you do is that you select the data set, you understand what is like a meaningful information and what is noise. And so, you know, the framework is that really help uh, all of us to put a framework to define what is just a noise and what uh, uh, instead could bring us some meaning. Thank you very much. I see a common ground here because you're both saying let's step back a little bit 
saying let's go to the very nature of the human being, the real understanding, even the philosophical understanding of the human being, and see what we can learn, again, about being so human. In fact, Rizal was saying, even with AI or machine learning, you don't start from scratch. You start from a data set, and then you guide the creation of the very algorithm. So we do have agency, although sometimes, as Mikkel was saying, we tend to um, put the technology up front, and then we tend to hide behind the, the, very, the very technology. There is a question from the audience. Um, the question is the following. Data are used to control, or can be used to, to that, to this extent, but they're also key to innovation. This is another interesting tension we face. Any thoughts on that? So, th there is a tension between control and innovation that Lucella was also, also mentioning. Any thought on this? Is this a trade-off? Is this a, a paradoxical situation in which we are forced to navigate through? Mikkel. I think these are, in, in many ways, questions that we have faced so many times before. Think about electricity. Electricity is absolutely central. I don't think anyone would say, oh, we, we shouldn't have electricity. But there are m different ways of getting electricity. We can build um, power plants that uh, rely on coal. We can um, use atomic uh, systems. We can... Um, we can use windmills. We have many, many different options when it comes to these types of resources. So I think those are the kind of questions we also simply need to bring into these conversations. In some ways, normalize uh, the tech companies, normalize the questions about technology, and sort of demystify these as you know, things that can only happen if they're done by engineers in Silicon Valley in, uh, in these hidden basements and so on. So to sort of bring it into normal conversations about the role of business in, in society. Thank you very much, Miko. So in other words, you're saying this is a kind of um, new wine in old wineskins, and uh, let's just uh, demystify the, 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 the centrality of technology. Very nice thought. Um, Luisella, control vis-a-vis -vis innovation. Where does the pendulum swing? true especially you know when we are talking about data i mean this is true if we think that innovation is brought uh, by data so um, i will challenge a bit this uh, um, equation you know data are like uh, data and so the way of in a way controlling people because you say okay i do know everything about you and so i can uh, spy you or i can influence you uh, is partially true, you know, innovation is uh, starting, when we think about technology, it's starting from uh, many different other places, you know, it doesn't mean that if I uh, decide to have something that is based on, uh, for instance, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, it doesn't mean that this is only related to data, okay, there are a lot of different other technologies, for instance, there is a startup we are working with that um, is like doing a kind of what we call predictive maintenance but listening to the machinery so because um, a machine that is uh, does do a different sound you can understand that maybe will be broken in uh, two weeks okay so and this is, doesn't require uh, innovation that is like uh, going into the control uh, phase you know th there are i think a, a lot of different nuances and sometimes you know is is really easy uh, i think it's an easy and sometimes demagogic point to say how ah, okay uh, they are collecting data about us they are spying about us and so on so this is i think a fast equation that we need to again demystify uh, there is for sure, uh, I mean, it's always to find the, the right balance uh, and also I would like to put it back the responsibility on the human beings because it's not the data that are wrong or the data that are evil or the tech that is evil. It's the usage that you may do and, you know, even sometimes there is a lot of myth about um, again, if you do train a data set and an algorithm, you know, now we do have all this debate about uh, bias that you may have in an algorithm. Why? Because uh, 
people were uh, the, the classic one is related to HR uh, because you know it was you know a really famous uh, company that was releasing this uh, machine learning uh, uh, algorithm that was uh, supposed to select the best candidate for a certain role and after running it they discovered oh you know what I mean this algorithm is selecting uh, you know the classic stereotype I don't know white men uh, with a Stanford degree and so on why this is really simple because this algorithm was trained by a data set that the data set is not about the uh, data scientist it's not the data scientist fault but it was like analyzing historical data obviously historically you know because our society is still biased uh, it resulted that the candidate selected for that specific role, let's say for being an engineer, was like a white man with a degree at Stanford. So is not the algorithm, so is again the human, and is the bias that we do have as a society. And in this case, maybe, you know, if uh, we do use, uh, you know, different data set, we try to balance and so on, maybe, you know, the algorithm can help us also to discover some of the patterns, some of the stereotype and the bias uh, we, we we are now still applying. So, you know, again, I would like to put the responsibility back to the human and don't use, uh, you know, the data file or the algorithm or the machine learning just an, as an excuse for not taking uh, our own responsibilities. Thank you very much. I think that although coming from different perspectives and different angles, we have reached a common consensus on the fact that we should step back recall and rediscover our human side and therefore stop hiding beyond technology and just go to the forefront of the development of technology and uh, you know exercise our human agency even even more in depth uh, you know this pandemic time has taught us a lot of bad things uh, some positive externalities is about but the idea of being punctual and digital respecting digital times we started a little bit late but now I think we can close the session. Before doing that, let me hand the floor to our rector, Andrea Prenciva, for his closing remarks. Please, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luca. Thank you. And welcome, uh, with a bit of a delay, to Luis Ella and to Mikkel for. And thanks a lot for this very interesting discussion, this interesting debate. Uh, which I've enjoyed, you know, partly on uh, looking at my phone when I was traveling and partly in presence. So this is the, say, the beauty of uh, 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 exploiting this, the opportunity that technologies uh, provide to us. Um, I, was, I, was, I was reflecting on uh, the, the key messages of today's uh, uh, seminar. And uh, um, ironically, I said, well, you know, we do, we have to be distant because of the, uh, the kind of the, um, the rules that uh, several governments, including the Italian ones, have imposed to us. But I do see that there is a lot of proximity from a cultural viewpoint, as, as Luca was uh, mentioning more than once. You know, the, uh, there's an interesting convergence uh, uh, between what uh, Luisella was mentioning, and Luisella comes from, from industry, and what, what uh, Minkel was saying, who is, a, who, is a, who is an academic. So there's a very much convergence, although I, mean, I do see, and uh, I'm glad about it, there are uh, you know, the perspective are pretty, pretty much complementary. So um, I do think that it's important to, to, to which is very much, you know, the, the kind of uh, Lewis approach to, uh, to, to pit uh, academic vis-a-vis -vis against, say, in inverted commas, of course, uh, uh, representative of the real world, so from industry or the professional community, but at the same time maintain the um, um, independence on the autonomous role of, of the different uh, uh, of the different actors who are actually although again they think about and they are focused on the same on the same topic data in this specific specific uh, seminar uh, they may develop different uh, and or complementary perspective let me underline a couple of things couple of messages that I, I I'd like to um, uh, that I picked while you were Discussing the first is uh, the one that the question that Luca raised about data as boundaries, which was picked up by both Luzella and Mikkel again. Um, this is a very fundamental question. Uh, I remember what Luzella mentioned, and then this was echoed by by Mikkel and Luzella mentioned. Well, it is down to us to understand where we can place the boundary and the extent to which we would like to say. Um, um, 
trust more digitalization in our own lives vis-a-vis -vis maintain a kind of privacy. And this reminded me um, um, of, a, of a, um, an interesting point made by Luciano Floridi uh, in a couple of months ago. In the, he, Luciano is a, was a, you know, is a, is a philosopher and he comes from uh, the, the theory of information. He's, he has this, this, this uh, um, idea, he basically divides history in three main blocks, you know, the prehistoric times, the you know, historic times when history actually started, and, uh, and what Luciano says is that basically now we're moving into the hyperhistorical times. And the two defining mo mo moments that, uh, again, uh, split, say, the, the, uh, the, the, the history of human beings in three, these three large uh, eras have to do with the way we transmit memory. And this is what Michael was saying at the beginning of the, of the seminar. So uh, the first defining moment was when we started uh, transmitting our memories by writing up things. And whereas the second defining moment is when we have started transmitting memories using digital technologies. Um, and this is extremely important in the light or in respect or in relation to what we've been discussing today. So which are the boundaries? Uh, and what Luciano says, you know, I'm going to second. This is really a defining moment because this is, we are the generation, okay, that we you know, understand what it means to be, to live in an analogic time and what it means to be, to, to, to live and to operate, to work, to, be, to entertain in digital times. So really this is the a defining moment to understand the extent to which where we can place the boundaries between what, how much we can, we can say, tell to or can live to the digital technology and how much we, can, we, can, we would like to, uh, to maintain, say, for, for, for us. Um, I enjoyed a lot of discussion theories, you know, being an academic, so we do need, you know, we can be, we are overloaded by data, but we do need theories to understand data. I keep saying that uh, we need to ask our students to go back in times and uh, uh, become kids again, because kids are very good at asking questions. Uh, we're not, and probably we should do it. We should do it again. And that's why I would like to, to, to our mantra at Lewis is to, is students as scholar, I would like to, to offer students this, the tools that we researchers have to have, have to develop, to formulate questions. Don't forget that good researchers are those who formulate better questions, as opposed to those who can find um, answers to the questions. Um, third, the last but not least, um, I heard this interesting discussion about data and innovation. And you know, as you know, until a few, few, few years ago, I was, uh, I, was, I was doing some research on innovation. And I, you know, I have to say that data are extremely important for innovation, but this was clear from the, the, the discussion. There's always an act of discovery by human beings. I like the fact that Luca underlined more than once the importance of human agency. This is fundamental. You know, you can be overloaded by data again, but you need, you know, that, uh, that aha moment that only human beings, at least now, or, and I hope for the next, uh, the next few years and decades or centuries, only you can, human beings can, can, uh, can produce. So let him wind up by thanking again, you know, Luisella, Michael, and uh, Luca for the fantastic moderation and the, the great discussion we had. Thanks to Christina and thanks to, to Yanis for bringing Mikkel uh, over to, to Lewis and uh, researching Lewis on uh, digital things, just to, to borrow what Christina has, has been saying for a while. And uh, so, the, the, so is uh, Yanis, is, uh, up, uh, uh, is alive and kicking, let me say. So again, uh, thanks again and uh, have a good, a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.